Hello, so today a different video. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a reading today of a book where for some reason you might not quite expect that this has anything to do with leadership, but I believe it has to do a lot with values and meaning, especially meaning. And I'll try to demonstrate that. This is the book, Bruce Chatwin Songlines. I think it should be, again, one of those standard books for leadership development, for meaning creation. Extremely important book. Um, it's uh, sort of a piece of fiction, but also autobiographical. Bruce Chatwin was in Australia and um, he writes about the song lines, the Aboriginal song lines, but also his personal travels in Australia. Now, I will just quote some passages from the book and comment on them. I think he makes a very good case, apart from the fact that perhaps he's not doing the song lines um, justice. That might be very well the case. Um, he is, however, postulating quite an interesting hypothesis in his book, which I believe is very important for meaning creation and thus also to the larger subject of leadership. And that is why I believe this is an important book within that discussion. He connects the um, act of walking, of traversing the land to rhythm and to meaning and to what the landscape means to us and why rhythm supersedes speech, for example, because before humans learned how to speak, they were standing upright and they were migrating. His claim is that migration is the original way of being, of experiencing life, and that this transition, this transformatory action of walking, of um, experiencing the world while traversing is, is actually one of our most fundamental experiences. So I'll just jump right in and I'll try to comment it. It's going to be a completely different format to the other ones. And let's have a look if I can make sense of that. So he writes here. Regardless of the words, it seems the melodic contour of the song describes the nature of the land over which the song passes. So if the lizard man were dragging his heels across the salt pans of Lake Eyer, you could expect a succession of long flats, like Chopin's funeral march. If he were skipping up and down the McDonnell escarpments, you'd have a series of arpeggios and glissandos, like Liszt's Hungarian rhapsodies. Certain phrases, certain combinations of musical notes are thought to describe the action of the ancestor's feet. One phrase would say salt pan, another creek bed, spinifex, sand hill, mulga scrub, rock face, and so forth. An expert songman, by listening to their order of succession, would count how many times his hero crossed a river or scaled a ridge and be able to calculate where and how far along a song line he was. He'd be able, said Arcardi, to hear a few bars and say, this is Middlebore, or that is Odna Data, where the ancestor did X, Y, or Z. So a musical phrase, I said, is a map reference. Music, said Arcardi, is a memory bank for finding one's way about in the world. So this short phrase here gives insight into what the song lines do, or at least what Bruce Chatwin ascribes to the song lines, where the Aborigines walked the country and sang, and they sang to what they had experienced. Or you could also say, while they were traversing the country, the country made a certain impression on them, 
and shaped the song so that the person listening to the song would recognize the countryside. And this is remarkable uh, in many regards. It would give the quality of rhythm, the quality of melody, quite different and very material meaning. Up to now we would see music uh, just as something which evokes certain um, emotions or feelings and we would subject ourselves to them, we would find that relaxing or inspiring or music could put us in some sort of trance-like state. But here he claims that the origins of music and song are quite practical and pragmatic. It is as if the song serves to recognize a certain landscape which evokes those feelings. Let's have another look to another page. Richard Lee calculated that a Bushman child will be carried a distance of 4,900 miles before he begins to walk on his own. Since during this rhythmic phase he will be forever naming the contents of his territory, it is impossible he will not become a poet. Again, this is the idea that the world to those walking it and migrating it and traversing it is first experienced as a rhythmic experience then as a melodic experience, and then we start making sense of it. Then that's why he says it is impossible that he will not become a poet because of the rhythmic quality of poetry. Poetry is very much dependent on rhythm and rhyme and has a completely different format than, for example, um, narrative, so stories. This is extremely in interesting if you think how important rhythm then becomes for the meaning-making process. As you can see, I am already speaking in a certain rhythm to emphasize my words. And probably this makes the speech much more interesting if I would just talk and now comes this and we will see what happens next and then the speech says this and Bruce Chatwin wrote this book about the Aborigines. So, the point that you're emphasizing your speech in a certain pattern makes a certain in impression on the listener. That might not be something quite new, it just serves as an example how important rhythm is. It could serve for you as an example if you talk to people, if you prepare your speeches, if you <laughs> have a meeting, a work meeting or any, any sort of exchange with people how you emphasize and what melodic quality do you give that what you're saying to people. And we know from work and um, uh, how things are being explained there, how instructions are being given, how negotiations are being conducted, that sadly enough it's very, very, very boring to listen to that. And one of the reasons is that this is not being used as an opportunity to put melody and rhythm into what is being said. So very little of that what is being said is then actually remembered as meaningful. Let's take another quote from the book. All our words for country, he said, are the same as the words for line. For this there was one simple explanation. Most of the outback Australia was arid scrub or desert, where rainfall was always patchy, and where one year of plenty might be followed by seven years of lean. To move in such landscape was survival, to stay in the same place, suicide. The definition of a man's own country was the place in which I do not have to ask. Yet to feel at home in that country depended on being able to leave it. Everyone hoped to have at least four ways out along which he could travel in a crisis. Every tribe, like it or not, had to cultivate relations with its neighbor. So 
I found this interesting in terms of territory and landscape and how the, this lang language which they're using all our words for country are the same the words for line that the country is that what meaning it has been ascribed to and what direction you then take. Um, we know from leadership that one of the many important aspects of leadership is this uh, aspect of discourse and hegemony. So to be able to shape the discourse and have some sort of um, uh, control over it or some sort of influence on the discourse. So in, in a very abstract sense, this actually relates to something very relevant today. What type of landscape, what sort of territory are you able to express? What are you able to put into language, into imagery and say, this is my territory. Here is where I am or this is the place in which I do not have to ask. And so I think, yeah, that becomes rather obvious that how we are able to provide that imagery, how we're able to put it into a melodic way of charismatic speaking very much marks then that territory and dominates also the discourse which we believe is important to bring forward. Ah, here again the, qu the question of rhythm. Apes have flat feet, we have sprung arches. According to Professor Napier, the human gait is long, lilting stride, one, two, one, two. So this is how we walk. With a fourfold rhythm built into the action of the feet as they come into contact with the ground. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Heels strike, weight along the outside of the foot, weight transferred to the ball of the foot, pushing off with the big toe. And I marked that again because it's it's again so obvious that first comes rhythm and then comes verbalization or some sort of melody which comes along with that rhythm which is shaped by what we have experienced and which we then try to explain to others what we have experienced. So think of it this way, are you able within your work or whatever you do are you able to find a rhythm in that? And are you able to express that rhythm to make it clear to others how important this particular subject is to you? And just think of rhetorics, which has many elements, rhythmic elements to it, which are used to bring a certain point across and be it just the fact of repeating certain aspects like in a chorus. So even the act of re repetition of a message is what makes then the message actually stick with the viewer. One thing which will you take away from this video is one thing is for certain because I'm going to repeat it over and over again is the importance of rhythm. First comes rhythm, then comes the melody, then comes the imagery, then comes the metaphor. <laughs> So, rhythm precedes language. Let's take another quote. Very good, here. The dry heart of Australia was a jigsaw of microclimates, of different minerals in the soil, and different plants and animals. A man raised in one part of the desert would know its flora and fauna backwards. He knew which plant attracted game. He knew his water. He knew where there were tubers underground. In other words, by naming all the things in his territory, he could always count on survival. But if you took him blindfold to another country, she said, that's somebody in the book, he might end up lost and starving because he'd lost his bearings? Yes. So you're saying that man makes his territory by naming the things in them? Yes, I am. So the territory are made by naming them. And 
so that's that, I found that very interesting. We'll, we'll come to that later again. So the the and why is that important? So because to make those connections between different parts of the territory, that is then what becomes meaningful. That is why you have to start having names for them. You have to understand uh, what relationship is between the plants and animals, where to find those animals, where to find actually the water within that territory. So that's why you have to start making those connections and transferring that knowledge through song in this case. And we'll come back to that point of naming in a minute again. This is also good. There were theories on how birds fix their position by the height of the sun, the phases of the moon, and the rising and setting of stars, and by how they make navigational adjustment if blown off course by a storm. Certain ducks and geese can record the choruses of frogs beneath them and know that they're flying over marsh. Other night flyers bounce their calls onto the ground below and catching the echo fix their altitude and the nature of the terrain. The howls of migrating fish can pass through the sides of a ship and wake up sailors from their bunks. A salmon knows the taste of its ancestral river. Dolphins flash echolocating clicks to the submarine reefs in order to steer a safe passage through. It has even occurred to me that when a dolphin triangulates to determine its position, its behavior is analogous to our own, as we name and compare the things encountered in our daily lives as so and so establish our place in the world. So we name the things to establish our place in the world, our place relative to these things. But it's not the naming itself which makes it meaningful. It is the, the placement within the, let's say, in, within the melody which evokes certain emotions. And that's where I wanted to say where the naming and the melodies and the rhythm all come together into one, yeah, one form. We believe that um, nowadays it's important that everything is completely rational, fact-based, mistakes are a huge mistake. So people rattle off um, Excel tables or uh, analysis sheets and just go blah, 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 and try not to give any inflection to what is being said in that moment. This is a huge mistake because that's not how the human mind works. The human mind works by giving it connotation to make the correct assumption on those facts, on those issues which we see on those plants, on that water, on those animals. That is actually how language has formed through that melodious quality, through that musical quality, not through just naming it. This is that, this is that, this is that. People were not, never, in fact, are or were robots who didn't feel anything as they encountered their environment. Now, as we are being, have been removed so far from that environment, been removed from those, from that emotional stimulus of environment, we start to believe that it's, it's, everything is purely rational and can be described through rational language alone. So we, we rip basically the meaning out of the language, which is that, which is that melody, which is that musical quality of, of a language, which has a rhythm, and we present it to others and they fall asleep. They're simply not interested. So what we go, what we do, we go to a coach or somebody who retrains us in rhetoric speaking and making interesting presentations and all that. And people have to be retrained in these <laughs> very basic, very basic issues. Instead of just having learned that from the beginning, if you want to convince anybody, if you want to make an impression on anybody, if you want to have any sort of charisma, then you should make start making melody and rhythm part of what you're doing, not of just of what you're saying, but actually what you're doing. So let me close with this quote. Trade means friendship and cooperation, and for the Aboriginal, 
the principal object of trade was song. So they, they traded actually in their songs. Song therefore brought peace because it was like they, they tr traded basically maps of territory. Yet I felt the song lines were not necessarily an Australian phenomenon, but universal, that they were the means by which man marked out his territory and so organized his social life. All other successive systems were variants or perversions of this original model. Hmm. Very, very likely that this is so. Let me go, and go one step further. Let us imagine Father Adam, the first human being, strolled around the garden. He puts a left foot forward and names a flower. He puts a right foot forward and names one, a stone. The verb carries him to the next stanza of the song. All animals, insects, birds, mammals, dolphins, fish and humpback whales have a navigation system we call triangulation. The mysteries of Komskian innate sentence structure becomes very simple if they are thought of as human triangulation, subject, object, verb, subject, object, verb as the human triangulation to navigate us through the world. So he makes this connection from migration. There in the book also the, the thought is that humans, human beings at first were always nomads, that they had to migrate because of how the climate shifted and changed. And through that traversing of country, that's how they started to make sense of the environment. And to make sense of the environment, first, what all, all they had was rhythm. Through the walking, through uh, the heart pounding, um, through breathing, through the rhythm of night and day. So rhythm became something which was constantly there and could help make sense of the world because it depended how fast you were walking, if you were afraid, your heart was beating faster, and so on and so forth. Then came this aspect of song, and the song was very much, the humming or the mel melody was very much in, in, um, infused by what they were seeing, what the landscape was like, so that informed this, um, this, this notion of song. And then came this question of language and naming things and giving things a name to be able to navigate around in the world. But all these things were always interconnected. They were not separate from each other. There was no attempt to separate rhythm, melody, and names and language from each other. It was one, one whole strata, one, one whole set of, a, of sense making and meaning creation. I think that's a, that's a very, very interesting thesis to think about, to let that sink in. That was just some uh, quotes from the book, uh, The Song Lines by Bruce Chatwin. Again, a very interesting way how to understand um, meaning creation. And uh, I have looked at uh, Ian McGilchrist's book, uh, which is a book about neuroscience and about how the left and the right hemisphere of the brain work. And he claims that we first understand the world in its metaphorical form and then start to categorize it and then rationalize about it. And I would claim that Bruce Chatwin goes a step further and says, we first understand the world through its rhythmic form and through its musical form. And then the images start to appear perhaps as a in its poetic form, its metaphorical form, and then we start to rationalize about that. So um, in terms of meaning creation and leadership, I think that gives some pointers where this might be going. That again, if it is accepted that leadership is an art form, just like sculpting or music making or filmmaking, it has similar qualities and it has also a rhythmic and a musical quality because these are very important to make meaning of our environment. I hope you enjoyed that video a little bit, something different today, a little bit of reading, and um, I'll see you in the next video.